Hey everybody, welcome back to our series on Vertex Operator Algebras. This is our 18th episode, and it is jam-packed with ideas. Our main objective is to prove the existence and uniqueness of what basically amounts to an inner product on our Heisenberg modules. But the main thrust of the argument will involve a slight generalization of the Heisenberg algebra. So let's get started. Let G be a Lie algebra with an inner product. You might remember that an isometry, an automorphism that preserves the inner product, is an involution on G if it squares to 1. We've been studying involutions in the context of twisted affine algebras. These, of course, are extensions of the product of G with the Laurent polynomials. A twisted affine algebra is basically the subset of the untwisted case that's invariant under the involution. If G is an abelian Lie algebra, then the brackets associated with its affine extension reduced to the central term. Hence, the commutator subalgebra of such an animal is a Heisenberg algebra. In this case, the simple map theta equals to minus 1 works as an involution. If G is not abelian, the map theta equals to minus 1 kind of fails to be a familiar homomorphism and is, well, a little bit awkward. This awkwardness leads us to a new definition, the anti-involution. We define an anti-involution to be a linear automorphism that squares to 1 and would preserve the bracket if not for an extra shuffle of the two arguments. Our default name for such things will be omega. Omega extends easily from G to its universal enveloping algebra, which you might recall is a quotient of the tensor algebra of G by the ideal engineered to identify the commutator of two elements in the second tensor power with the Lie bracket. This extended omega acts on the product xy as omega y times omega x for x and y in U of G. Of course, it still squares to 1. Today's construction has a strong Heisenberg flavor to it, but it's actually slightly more general. It's kind of amusing to read different attempts by the different authors, FLM, to describe Kasmudi-ish algebras at different times in the text. We call a Lie algebra triangular if there is a triangular decomposition to it. That is, if it can be written as the direct sum of three subalgebras, n minus, h, and n plus. Here, h is an abelian subalgebra, and the direct sum of h with either of the n's, of course, is also a subalgebra. For those folks who might know a little bit about the representation theory of Lie algebras, h plays a role analogous to the Cartan subalgebra. The subalgebras n play the role of root or weight spaces, and the anti-involution omega maps between them. h, of course, is invariant under omega. Like the Heisenberg modules, we'll study the G module induced by a one-dimensional H plus N plus module. To that end, we'll define a linear form lambda, which maps from the abelian subalgebra H to the field F. The vacuum for our module is basically the codomain of lambda. Let's fix V sub lambda as the basis vector for the vacuum. To define the module, we now specify the H plus N plus action over F, the action of h on v lambda amounts to scalar multiplication by its image in lambda. And as usual, n plus annihilates the vacuum. As advertised, this construction is similar to the Heisenberg module, except here lambda h plays the role of k. The novelty here is that the central subalgebra has a dimension of arbitrary but finite size. Keeping with our Heisenberg analogy, we'll define the g module m of lambda as the module induced by the h plus n plus module f lambda. You might remember that the Heisenberg module simplified to the symmetric algebra over the negatively graded subalgebra. We're going to see a somewhat similar simplification for our analog m of lambda. Recall that the poincare birkhoff witt theorem implies that the universal enveloping algebra of the direct sum of two subalgebras is equivalent to the tensor product of the universal enveloping algebra of those terms. Now, here's a bit of a tricky argument that FLM puts together. Suppose G has a Z grading, whose only non-trivial subspaces have positive grading, just like, you know, in the tensor algebra. We can split out the zeroth graded subspace, which is essentially the field itself. Applying the aforementioned direct sum trick from the poincare birkhoff witt theorem, 
we can identify u of g as the direct sum of f and the space which we might call u of g times g, which is the span of elements represented as a product, one each from u of g and g. Alternatively, we could have used g times u of g. Recall the fact that the tensor product with respect to f of f itself is of course f. Ditto for any module over f, really. This fact helps when we split both u of n plus or minus in the fashion discussed above, which shows us that u of g is decomposable into the direct sum of u of h with some other junk. That other junk are the product terms which, by convention, we have right action by n minus and left action by n plus. And this is an important point because it allows us to easily project out the central factor, u of h. Indeed, let's define the projection operator P, which projects u of g to u of h, which is isomorphic to the symmetric algebra of h since it's abelian. This projectability of the module m of lambda is as simple as we're going to get. We now turn our attention to the main idea of today, which we frame as a proposition. Following FLM, we claim that there exists a unique, symmetric bilinear form on m of lambda that satisfies two conditions. First, the bilinear form is normalized so that v lambda with v lambda is unity. And the second involves the anti-involution omega. Given two vectors in m lambda, say v1 and v2, and an operator, say x, the bilinear form of x on v1 with v2 equals the bilinear form of v1 with omega of x on v2. In effect, the bilinear form implicitly defines a sort of dual space for m of lambda, on which the action of n plus is exchanged with n minus. We now prove the claim. First consider a left ideal of u of g, namely those elements which annihilate the basis vector v lambda. It should be clear, then, that the module m of lambda is isomorphic to the quotient of u of g by this ideal. Now. Since that ideal annihilates v lambda, the projection of that ideal down to the abelian subalgebra must as well. And the projection of the dual space, omega acting on the annihilator, must also vanish. Evidently, the action of omega and p commute, for which you can thank the defining relations of the triangular decomposition. Now, for the moment, let's suppose this bilinear exists. The associated product of two vectors vx and vy can be brought into standard form, where vx equals the operator x acting on v lambda, and ditto for vy. Using the definition of the assumed bilinear form, we have a kind of standard representation for this bilinear, from which we can observe the following. If omega of x on y acts within the bilinear as scalar multiplication in a well-defined way, we'd be done. It would be uniquely defined but also we would have shown by construction that it exists. So let's poke around with the action of omega x, y. Since u of g has the decomposition we discussed earlier, we can see that the action of any operator q in this context must break into either one of p of q or some other junk. That other junk, of course, is effectively modeled by something with a factor of a left action by a member of n plus, or right action by a member of n minus. The n plus-ish left action obviously causes the product to vanish. So we're left with the projection to q minus. But because of the dual nature of the bilinear product, we can push the q minus to the left-hand side, transforming it into a left action of n plus via the anti-involution, which also vanishes when acting upon v lambda. Thus, the bilinear product, should it exist, amounts to the projection of the relevant operators to the abelian subalgebra. Which means that the bilinear equals the one-form lambda acting on the projection of omega x, y. Which means that we have the scalar multiplication form of the action we discussed earlier, the one that we needed. Symmetry of the bilinear form, of course, follows from the fact that omega commutes with the projection. And we're done. And we're also done for today. Next time, we'll zero in on a specific application of these ideas to complex numbers and define a Hermitian form.